Chapter 1 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Section 1. Part 5. The Period of Expansion The Eagle's Song The lioness whelped, and the sturdy cub was seized by an eagle and carried up, and homed for a while in an eagle's nest, and slept for a while on an eagle's breast, and the eagle taught it the eagle's song, to be staunch and valiant and free and strong. The lion whelp sprang from the eerie nest, from the lofty crag where the queen birds rest. He fought the king on the spreading plain, and drove him back o'er the foaming main. He held the land as a thrifty chief, and reared his cattle and reaped his sheaf, nor sought the help of a foreign hand, yet welcomed all to his own free land. Two were the sons that the country bore to the northern lakes and the southern shore. And chivalry dwelt with the southern sun, And industry lived with the northern one. Tears for the time when they broke and fought, Tears was the price of the union wrought. And the land was red in a sea of blood, Where brother for brother had swelled the flood. And now that the two are one again, Behold on their shield the word refrain, And the lion cubs twain sing the eagle's song, to be staunch and valiant and free and strong. For the eagle's beak and the lion's paw, and the lion's fangs and the eagle's claw, and the eagle's swoop and the lion's might, and the lion's leap and the eagle's sight, shall guard the flag with the word refrain, now that the two are one again. Richard Mansfield Chapter 1. Reconstruction and After The war was over, but three great questions remained to be settled. How were the people of the South to be regarded? How was the Union to be reconstructed? What was to be done with the three millions of Negroes who had been given their freedom? These were the questions which came before the 39th Congress. To the 39th Congress O people chosen, are ye not, likewise the chosen of the Lord, to do His will and speak His word? From the loud thunderstorm of war, not man alone hath called ye forth, but He, the God of all the earth. The torch of vengeance in your hands He quenches, unto Him belongs the solemn recompense of wrongs. Enough of blood the land has seen, and not by cell or gallows stair shall ye the way of God prepare. Say to the pardon seekers, keep your manhood, bend no suppliant knees, nor palter with unworthy pleas. Above your voices sounds the wail of starving men. We shut in vain our eyes to pillows ghastly stain. What words can drown that bitter cry? What tears wash out the stain of death? What oaths confirm your broken faith? From you alone the guarantee Of union, freedom, peace we claim. We urge no conqueror's terms of shame. Alas, no victor's pride is ours. We bend above our triumphs won, Like David or his rebel son. Be men, not beggars. Cancel all, by one brave, generous action, Trust your better instincts, and be just. Make all men peers before the law. Take hands from off the Negro's throat. Give black and white an equal vote. Keep all your forfeit lives and lands, but give the common law's redress to labor's utter nakedness. Revive the old heroic will. Be in the right as brave and strong as ye have proved yourselves in wrong. Defeat shall then be victory, 
your loss the wealth of full amends, and hate be love, and foes be friends. Then buried be the dreadful past, its common slain be mourned, and let all memories soften to regret. Then shall the Union's mother heart, her lost and wandering ones recall, forgiving and restoring all, and freedom break her marble trance above the Capitolian dome, stretch hands and bid ye welcome home. John Greenleaf Whittier Few men could have been worse fitted for the delicate task of Reconstruction than Andrew Johnson. But even his policy, narrow as it was, was not narrow enough to suit the radical Republicans in Congress. Mr. Johnson's Policy of Reconstruction Some Comment from the Boys in Blue His policy, do you say? By heaven, who says so lies in his throat? "'Twas our policy, boys, from our muster day, "'through skirmish and bivouac, march and fray. "'His policy, do you say? "'His policy, do but note, "'tis a pitiful falsehood for you to say. "'Did he bid all the stars in our banner float? "'Was it he shouted union from every throat "'through the long war's weary day? "'His policy, how does it hap? "'Has the old word union no meaning, pray?' What meant the U.S. upon every cap, Upon every button, belt, and strap? T'was our policy all the way. His policy, that may do, For a silly and empty political brag, But t'was held by every boy in blue, When he lifted his right hand, staunch and true, And swore to sustain the flag. We are with him, none the less. He works for the same great end we sought. We feel for the South in its deep distress, and to get the old union restored we press. T'was for this we enlisted and fought. Be it his or whose it may, tis the policy, boys, that we avow. There were noble hearts in the ranks of gray, as they proved on many a bloody day, and we would not oppress them now. Let us all forgive and forget. It was thus Grant spoke to General Lee, when, with wounds still raw and bayonets wet, the chiefs of the two great armies met beneath the old apple tree. Charles Graham Halpine The leader of this coterie was Thaddeus Stevens. He declared the South was in a state of anarchy, demanded that it be placed under military rule, and that suffrage be extended to the Negroes. In February 1868, he introduced a resolution that Andrew Johnson... President of the United States, be impeached of high crimes and misdemeanors in office. But at the trial which followed the proceedings were shown to have been actuated by partisan bitterness, and the President was acquitted. The verdict was a heavy blow to Stevens. He had burned himself out and died in August. Thaddeus Stevens Died August 11, 1868 An eye with the piercing eagle's fire not the look of the gentle dove, not his the form that men admire, nor the face that tender women love. Working first for his daily bread with the humblest toilers of the earth, never walking with free, proud tread, crippled and halting from his birth, wearing outside a thorny suit of sharp, sarcastic, stinging power, sweat at the core as sweetest fruit or inmost heart of fragrant flower. Fierce and trenchant the haughty foe felt his words like a sword of flame, but to the humble, poor and low. Soft as a woman's, his accents came. Not his the closest, tenderest friend, no children blessed his lonely way, but down in his heart until the end the tender dream of his boyhood lay. His mother's faith he had held not fast, but he loved her living, mourned her dead, and he kept her memory to the last, as green as the sod above her bed. He held as sacred in his home whatever things she wrought or planned, and never suffered change to come to the work of her industrious hand. For her who pillowed first his head, he heaped with a wealth of flowers the grave, while he chose to sleep in an unmarked bed, 
by his master's humblest poor, the slave. Suppose he swerved from the straightest course, that the things he should not do he did, that he hid from the eyes of mortals close, such sins as you and I have hid? Or suppose him worse than you, what then? Judge not, lest you be judged for sin. One said who knew the hearts of men, who loveth much shall a pardon win. The Prince of Glory for sinners bled, his soul was bought with a royal price, and his beautified feet on flowers may tread, today with his Lord in paradise. Phoebe Carey The South's condition, meanwhile, was pitiful indeed. Negroes, led by carpetbaggers from the North, secured the ascendancy in state government. Millions of dollars were wasted or stolen, and it looked for a time as though a great section of the country was doomed to Negro domination. South Carolina to the states of the North, especially to those that formed a part of the original Thirteen. I lift these hands with iron fetters banded, Beneath the scornful sunlight and cold stars. I rear my once imperial forehead branded By alien shames and medicable scars. Like some pale captive, shunned by all the nations, I crouch, unpitied, quivering and apart, Laden with countless woes and desolations, The lifeblood freezing round a broken heart. About my feet, splashed red with blood of slaughters, My children gathering in wild, mournful throngs, Despairing sons, frail infants, stricken daughters, Rehearse the awful burden of their wrongs. Vain is their cry, and worse than vain their pleading. I turn from stormy breasts, from yearning eyes, To mark where freedom's outraged form receding, Wanes in chill shadow, down the midnight skies. I wooed her once in wild, tempestuous places. The purple vintage of my soul outpoured to win and keep her unrestrained embraces. What time the olive crown o'ertop the sword? Oh, Northmen, with your gallant heroes blending, mine in old years for this sweet goddess died. But now, ah, shame, all other shame transcending, your pitiless hands have torn her from my side. What? Tis a tyrant party's treacherous action. Your hand is clean, your conscience clear, ye sigh. Aye, but ere now your sires had throttled faction, or pealed o'er half the world their battle cry. Its voice outrung from solemn mountain passes, swept by wild storm winds of the Atlantic strand. To where the swart Sierra's sullen grasses Droop in low languors of the sunset land. Never, since earthly states began their story, Hath any suffered, bided, born like me. At last, recalling all mine ancient glory, I vowed my fettered commonwealth to free. Even at the thought, beside the prostrate column, Of chartered rights which blasted lay and dim, Uprose my noblest son with purpose solemn, While host on host his brethren followed him. Wrong, grasped by truth, arraigned by law, Whose sober majestic mandates rule o'er change in time, Smit by the ballot like some flushed October, Reeled in the autumn rankness of his crime, Struck, tortured, pierced, but not a blow returning, The steadfast phalanx of my honored braves, Planted their bloodless flag where sunrise burning, Flashed a new splendor o'er our martyrs' graves. What then, O sister states, What welcome omen of love and concord Crossed our brightening blue? The foes we vanished, are they not your foemen? Our laws upheld, your sacred safeguards too? Yet scarce had victory crowned our grand endeavor, And peace crept out from shadowy glooms remote, Then, as if bared to blast all hope forever, your tyrant's sword shone glittering at my throat. Once more my bursting chains were reunited, Once more barbarian plaudits wildly rung, O'er the last promise of deliverance blighted, The prostrate purpose and the palsied tongue, Ah, faithless sisters, neath my swift undoing, 
Piers the black presage of your wrath to come. Above your heads are signal clouds of ruin, whose lightnings flash, whose thunders are not dumb. There towers a judgment seat beyond our seeing. There lives a judge whom none can bribe or blind, before whose dread decree your spirit fleering may reap the whirlwind, having sown the wind. I, in that day of justice, fierce and torrid, when blood, your blood, outpours like poisoned wine, pointing to these chained limbs, this blasted forehead, may mock your ruin as ye mocked at mine. Paul Hamilton Hayne But the white people of the South rallied at last, asserted their supremacy, and seized the reins of government. The famous Ku Klux Klan was organized and spread terror among the Negroes by its sure and swift administration of punishment, just and unjust. Ku Klux We have sent him seeds of the melon's core and nailed a warning upon his door. By the Ku Klux laws we can do no more. Down in the hollow, mid-crib and stack, the roof of his low-porched house looms black, not a line of light at the door-sill's crack. Yet arm and mount and mask and ride, the hounds can sense, though the fox may hide, and for a word too much men oft have died. The clouds blow heavy towards the moon, the edge of the storm will reach it soon, the kildee cries and the lonesome loon, the cloud shall flush with a wilder glare than the lightning makes with his angled flare when the Ku Klux verdict is given there. In the pause of the thunder rolling low, a rifle's answer, who shall know, from the wind's fierce hurl and the rain's black blow. Only the signature written grim at the end of the message brought to him, a hempen rope and a twisted limb. So arm and mount and mask and ride, the hounds can sense, though the fox may hide, and for a word too much men oft have died. Madison K. Wien. The North kept its hands off and permitted the South to work out its own destiny, which it did blindly and blunderingly enough. Yet bravely, too, for it had only ashes to build from. But from the ashes a new land arose, and a better one. THE REAR GUARD The guns are hushed, on every field once flowing, With war's red flood May's breath of peace is shed, And spring's young grass and gracious flowers are growing Above the dead. Ye gray old men whom we this day are greeting, Honor to you, honor and love and trust. Brave to the brave, your soldier hands are meeting, across their dust. Bravely they fought who charged when flags were flying, in cannon's crash, in screech and scream of shell. Bravely they fell, who lay alone and dying, in battle's hell. Honor to them! Far graves today are flinging, up through the soil, peace blooms to meet the sun, and daisied heads to summer winds are singing, their long, well done. Our vanguard, they, they went with hot blood flushing, at battle's din, at joy of bugle's call. They fell with smiles, the flood of young life gushing, full brave the fall. But braver ye who, when the war was ended, and bugle's call and wave of flag were done, could come back home, so long left undefended, your cause unwon. And twist the useless sword to hook of reaping, Rebuild the homes, set back the empty chair, And brave a land where waste and want were keeping guard everywhere. All this you did, your courage strong upon you, And out of ashes, wreck, a new land rose. Through years of war no braver battle won you Against fiercer foes. And now today a prospered land is cheering And lifting up her voice in lusty pride. For you gray men who fought and wrought, not fearing, battles red tide. Our rear guard, ye whose step is slowing, slowing, whose ranks, earth-thinned, are filling otherwhere, who wore the gray, 
the gray, alas, still showing on bleaching hair. For forty years you've watched this land grow stronger. For forty years you've been its bulwark, stay. Tarry a while, pause yet a little longer upon the way. And set our feet where they may be no turning, and set our faces straight on duty's track, where there may be for stray strange goods no yearning, no looking back. And when for you the last tattoo has sounded, and on death's silent field you've pitched your tent, when bowed through tears the arc of life has rounded to full content. We that are left will count it guerdon royal, our heritage no years can take away, that we were born of those unflinching loyal who wore the gray. Irene Fowler Brown As early as 1867, the women of Columbus Miss decorated alike the graves of Confederate and Union soldiers, an action which was the first of many such. The Blue and the Gray, 1867 By the flow of the inland river, whence the fleets of iron have fled, where the blades of the grave grass quiver, asleep are the ranks of the dead. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the one, the blue, under the other, the gray. These in the robings of glory, those in the gloom of defeat, all with the battle-blood gory, in the dusk of eternity meet. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the laurel, the blue, under the willow, the gray. From the silence of sorrowful hours, the desolate mourners go, lovingly laden with flowers, alike for the friend and the foe. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the roses, the blue, under the lilies, the gray. So with an equal splendor, the morning sun rays fall, with a touch impartially tender, on the blossoms blooming for all. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, Broidered with gold, the blue, Mellowed with gold, the gray. So when the summer calleth on forest and field of grain, With an equal murmur falleth the cooling drip of the rain. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, Wet with the rain, the blue, wet with the rain, the gray. Sadly, but not with upbraiding, the generous deed was done. In the storm of the years that are fading, no braver battle was won. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the blossoms, the blue, under the garlands, the gray. No more shall the war cry sever, or the winding rivers be red. They banish our anger forever, when they laurel the graves of our dead. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, Love and tears for the blue, tears and love for the gray. Francis Miles Finch When the South was swept by yellow fever a few years later, the North rushed to its relief, in a way which showed how completely old animosities had been forgotten. The stricken South to the North When ruthful time the South's memorial places, her heroes' graves had wreathed in grass and flowers, when peace ethereal, crowned by all her graces, returned to make more bright the summer hours, when doubtful hearts revived and hopes grew stronger, when old sore cankering wounds that pierced and stung throbbed with their first mad feverous pain no longer, while the fair future spake with flattering tongue, when once, once more she felt her pulses beating to rhythms of healthful joy and brave desire, lo! Round her doomed horizon darkly meeting, A pall of blood-red vapors feigned with fire. Oh, ghastly portent of fast-coming sorrows, Of doom that blasts the blood and blights the breath, Robs youth and manhood of all golden morrows, And life's clear goblet brims with wine of death. Oh, swift fulfillment of this portent dreary, Oh, nightmare rule of ruin racked by fears, 
heartbroken wail and solemn miserere, imperious anguish and soul-melting tears. O oh, faith thrust downward from celestial splendors. O oh, love grief-bound with palely murmurous mouth. O oh, agonized by life's supreme surrenders. Behold her now, the scourged and suffering south. No balm in Gilead? Nay, but while her forehead, pallid and drooping, lies in foulest dust, there steals across the desolate spaces torrid a voice of manful cheer and heavenly trust. A hand redeeming breaks the frozen starkness of palsied nerve and dull despondent brain, rolls back the curtain of malignant darkness, and shows the eternal blue of heaven again. Revealing there, o'er worlds convulsed and shaken, that face whose mystic tenderness enticed, to hope newborn earth's lost bereaved forsaken. Ah, still beyond the tempest smiles the Christ. Whose voice, whose hand, O oh, thanks, divinest master, thanks for those grand emotions which impart grace to the north to feel the south's disaster, the south to bow with touched and cordial heart. Now, now at last, the links which war had broken are welded fast at mercy's charmed commands. Now, now, at last, the magic words are spoken, which blend in one two long divided lands. O oh, north! You came with warrior strife and clangor. You left our south one gory burial ground. But love, more potent than your haughtiest anger, subdues the souls which hate could only wound. Paul Hamilton Hain On July 29, 1866, the first submarine cable was completed between Ireland and Newfoundland. The enterprise having been undertaken and carried through by Cyrus Westfield. How Cyrus Laid the Cable July 29, 1866 Come, listen all unto my song. It is no silly fable. Tis all about the mighty cord they call the Atlantic Cable. Bold Cyrus Field, he said, says he, I have a pretty notion that I can run a telegraph across the Atlantic Ocean. Then all the people laughed and said they'd like to see him do it. He might get half seas over, but he never could go through it. To carry out his foolish plan, he never would be able. He might as well go hang himself with his Atlantic cable. But Cyrus was a valiant man, a fellow of decision, and heeded not their mocking words, their laughter and derision. Twice did his bravest efforts fail, and yet his mind was stable. He want the man to break his heart, because he broke his cable. Once more, my gallant boys, he cried. Three times, you know the fable. I'll make it thirty, muttered he, but I will lay the cable. Once more they tried, hurrah, hurrah, what means this great commotion? The Lord be praised, the cable's laid across the Atlantic Ocean. Loud ring the bells, four flashing through, six hundred leagues of water. Old Mother England's benison salutes her eldest daughter. O'er all the land the tidings speed, and soon in every nation they'll hear about the cable with profoundest admiration. Now long live President and Queen, and long live gallant Cyrus, and may his courage, faith, and zeal with emulation fire us. And may we honor evermore the manly, bold, and stable, and tell our sons to make them brave how Cyrus laid the cable. John Godfrey Sachs The Cable Hymn O lonely bay of Trinity, O dreary shores give ear, Lean down into the white-lipped sea, The voice of God to hear. From world to world his couriers fly, thought-winged and shod with fire. The angel of his stormy sky rides down the sunken wire. What saith the herald of the Lord? The world's long strife is done, close wedded by that mystic cord. Its continents are one. And one in heart, as one in blood, shall all her peoples be. 
the hands of human brotherhood, are clasped beneath the sea. Through Orient seas, o'er Afric's plain, and Asian mountains born, the vigor of the northern brain shall nerve the world outworn. From clime to clime, from shore to shore, shall thrill the magic thread. The new Prometheus steals once more, the fire that wakes the dead. Throb on, strong pulse of thunder, beat from answering beach to beach, fuse nations in thy kindly heat, and melt the chains of each. Wild terror of the sky above, glide tamed and dumb below, bear gently, ocean's carrier dove, thy errands to and fro. Weave on, swift shuttle of the Lord, beneath the deep so far, the bridal robe of earth's accord, the funeral shroud of war. For lo, the fall of ocean's wall, space mocked and time outrun, and round the world the thought of all is as the thought of one. The poles unite, the zones agree, the tongues of striving cease, as on the sea of Galilee the Christ is whispering, Peace. John Greenleaf Whittier The most notable accomplishment of Johnson's administration was the purchase from Russia in 1867 of the territory of Alaska. The price paid was $7,200,000, and the session was formally made on June 20. An Arctic Vision, June 20, 1867 Where the short-legged Eskimo waddle in the ice and snow, and the playful polar bear nips the hunter unaware. Where by day they track the ermine, and by night another vermin. Segment of the frigid zone, where the temperature alone warms on St. Elias' cone. Polar dock, where nature slips from the ways her icy ships. Land of fox and deer and sable, shore end of our western cable. Let the news that flying goes Thrill through all your Arctic flows, and reverberate the boast from the cliffs off Beachy's coast, till the tidings circling round every bay of Norton Sound throw the vocal tide wave back to the isles of Kodiak. Let the stately polar bears waltz around the pole in pairs, and the walrus in his glee bear his tusk of ivory, while the bold sea unicorn calmly takes an extra horn. All ye polar skies reveal your very rarest of parhelia. Trip it, all ye merry dancers, in the airiest of lancers. Slide, ye solemn glaciers, slide, one inch farther to the tide, nor in rash precipitation upset Tyndall's calculation. Know you not what fate awaits you, or to whom the future mates you? All ye icebergs make salam. You belong to Uncle Sam. On the spot where Eugene Sue led his wretched, wandering Jew, stands a form whose features strike, Russ and Eskimo alike. He it is whom scalds of old, in their runic rhymes foretold, lean of flank and lank of jaw, see the real northern Thor. See the awful Yankee leering just across the Straits of Bering, on the drifted snow too plain sinks his fresh tobacco stain, just beside the deep indentation of his number ten. Leaning on his icy hammer stands the hero of this drama, and above the wild duck's clamor in his own peculiar grammar. With its linguistic disguises, lo, the Arctic prologue rises. Wall, I reckon, taint so bad, seein' as twas all they had. True, the springs are rather late, and early falls predominate, but the ice crop's pretty sure, and the air is kind of pure. Taint so very mean a trade, when the land is all surveyed. There's a right smart chance of fur chase, all along this recent purchase. And, unless the stories fail, every fish from cod to whale. Rocks, too, maybe quartz, let's see. T'would be strange if there should be. 
Seems I've heard such stories told. Eh, why bless us. Yes, it's gold. While the blows are falling thick from his California pick, you may recognize the Thor of the vision that I saw. Freed from legendary glamour, see the real magician's hammer. Bret Hart Alaska Ice built, ice bound, and ice bounded. Such cold seas of silence, such room, such snow light, such sea light confounded, with thunders that smite like a doom. Such grandeur, such glory, such gloom. Hear that boom, hear that deep, distant boom of an avalanche hurled down this unfinished world. Ice seas and ice summits, ice spaces, in splendor of white as God's throne, ice worlds to the pole, and ice places, untracked and unnamed and unknown. Hear that boom, hear the grinding, the groan, of the ice gods in pain, hear the moan of yon ice mountain hurled down this unfinished world. Joaquin Miller Friday, September 24, 1869, witnessed one of the greatest panics ever known in the United States. When Jay Gould and a few associates managed to drive the price of gold up to 162 and a half. Israel Friars bid for gold. Friday, September 24, 1869. Zounds! How the price went flashing through. Wall Street, William, Broad Street, New, all the specie and all the land, held in one ring by a giant hand. For millions more it was ready to pay, and throttled the street on hangman's day. Up from the gold pit's nether hell, while the innocent fountain rose and fell, loud and higher the bidding rose, and the bulls triumphant faced their foes. It seemed as if Satan himself were in it, lifting it, one per cent a minute, through the bellowing broker there amid, who made the terrible final bid. High over all, and ever higher, was heard the voice of Israel Friar. A doleful knell in the storm-swept mart, Five millions more, and for any part, I'll give one hundred and sixty. Israel Friar, the government Jew, Good as the best, soaked through and through, with credit gained in the year he sold, our treasury's precious hoard of gold. Now through his thankless mouth rings out the leaguer's last and cruelest shout. Pity the shorts? Not they indeed, while a single rival's left to bleed. Down come dealers in silks and hides, crowding the gold room's rounded sides, jostling, trampling each other's feet, uttering groans in the outer street, watching, with upturned faces pale, the scurrying index marks its tail. Hearing the bid of Israel Friar, that ominous voice, would it never tire? Five millions more, for any part. If it breaks your firm, if it cracks your heart, I'll give one hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty can't be. What will the bears at forty do? How will the merchants pay their dues? How will the country stand the news? What'll the banks? But listen, hold, in screwing upward the price of gold to that dangerous last particular peg. They have killed their goose with the golden egg. Just there the metal came pouring out, always at once like a water spout, or a rushing, gushing yellow flood that drenched the bulls wherever they stood. Small need to open the Washington main, their coffer dams were burst with the strain. It came by runners, it came by wire, to answer the bid of Israel Friar. It poured in millions from every side, and almost strangled him as he cried, I'll give one hundred and sixty! Like Vulcan after Jupiter's kick, or the aphoristical rocket's stick. Down, down, down the premium fell, faster than this rude rhyme can tell. Thirty percent the index slid, Yet Friar still kept making his bid. One hundred and sixty for any part. The sudden ruin had crazed his heart. Shattered his senses, 
cracked his brain, and left him crying again and again, still making his bid at the market's top, like the Dutchman's leg that never could stop. One hundred and sixty, five millions more, till they dragged him howling off the floor. The very last words that seller and buyer heard from the mouth of Israel Fryer, a cry to remember long as they live, were, I'll take five millions more, I'll give, I'll give one hundred and sixty. Suppose, to avoid the appearance of evil, there's such a thing as a personal devil, it would seem that his highness here got hold, for once, of a bellowing bull in gold. Whether bull or bear, it wouldn't much matter, should Israel Fryer keep up his clatter. On earth or under it, as they say, he is doomed till the general judgment day. When the clerk, as he cites him to answer for it, shall bid him keep silence in that court. But it matters most, as it seems to me, that my countrymen, great and strong and free, so marvel at fellows who seem to win, that if even a clown can only begin, by stealing a railroad and use its purse, for cornering stocks and gold, or worse, for buying a judge and legislature, and sinking still lower poor human nature, the gaping public, whatever befall, will swallow him, tandem, harlots, and all, while our rich men drivel and stand amazed at the dust and pother his gang have raised, and make us remember a nursery tale of the four and twenty who feared one snail. What's bred in the bone will breed, you know, clowns and their trainers high and low, will cut such capers long as they dare, while honest poverty says its prayer. But tell me what prayer or fast can save some hoary candidate for the grave. The market's wrinkled giant despair, muttering, brooding, scheming there, founding a college or building a church, lest heaven should leave him in the lurch. Better come out in the rival way, issue your scrip in open day, and pour your wealth in the grimy fist of some gross-mouthed gambling pugilist. Leave toil and poverty where they lie, pass thinkers, workers, artists by. Your pothouse fag from his counters bring, and make him into a railway king. Between such Gentiles and such Jews, little enough one finds to choose, Either the other will buy and use, eat the meat and throw him the bone, and leave him to stand the brunt alone. Let the tempest come that's gathering near, and give us a better atmosphere. Edmund Clarence Stedman On October 8 and 9, 1871, Chicago, which had grown to be the greatest city in the West, was almost entirely destroyed by fire. An area of three and a half square miles was burned over. Two hundred people were killed and a hundred thousand rendered homeless. Chicago, October 8 through 10, 1871. Men said at Vespers, all is well. In one wild night, the city fell. Fell shrines of prayer and marts of gain, before the fiery hurricane. On three score spires had sunset shone, where ghastly sunrise looked on none. Men clasped each other's hands and said, The city of the West is dead. Brave hearts who fought in slow retreat, the fiends of fire from street to street, turned, powerless, to the blinding glare, the dumb defiance of despair. A sudden impulse thrilled each wire, it signaled round that sea of fire. Swift words of cheer, warm heart throbs came, in tears of pity died the flame. From east, from west, from south and north, the messages of hope shot forth, and, underneath the severing wave, the world, full-handed, reached to save. Fair seemed the old, but fairer still, the new, the dreary void shall fill with dearer homes than those o'erthrown, for love shall lay each cornerstone. Rise, stricken city, from thee throw the ashen sackcloth of thy woe, and build, as to Amphion's strain, to songs of cheer thy walls again. 
How shriveled in thy hot distress The primal sin of selfishness! How instant rose to take thy part The angel in the human heart! Ah! Not in vain the flames that tossed Above thy dreadful holocaust! The Christ again has preached through thee The gospel of humanity! Then lift once more thy towers on high, And fret with spires the western sky, To tell that God is yet with us, And love is still miraculous. John Greenleaf Whittier Chicago Blackened and bleeding, helpless, panting, prone, On the charred fragments of her shattered throne, Lies she who stood but yesterday alone, Queen of the West, by some enchanter taught, To lift the glory of Aladdin's court, Then lose the spell that all that wonder wrought, Like her own prairies by some chance seed sown, Like her own prairies in one brief day grown, Like her own prairies in one fierce night moan. She lifts her voice, and in her pleading call, We hear the cry of Macedon to Paul, The cry for help that makes her kin to all, but haply with wane fingers may she feel The silver cup hid in the proffered meal, The gifts her kinship and our loves reveal. Bret Hart The whole country rallied to the aid of the stricken city. An aid and relief society was at once formed, and within a month had received subscriptions aggregating three and a half millions. Chicago Gaunt in the midst of the prairie, she who was once so fair, Charred and rent are her garments, heavy and dark like cerements, Silent, but round her the air, plaintively wails, miserere. Proud like a beautiful maiden, art-like from forehead to feet, Was she still pressed like a leman, close to the breast of the demon? Lusting for one so sweet, so were her shoulders laden. Friends she had, rich in her treasures, Shall the old taunt be true? Fallen, they turned their cold faces, Seeking new wealth gilded places, Saying we never knew Aught of her smiles or her pleasures. Silent she stands on the prairie, Wrapped in her fire-scathed sheet. Around her, thank God, is the nation, Weeping for her desolation, Pouring its gold at her feet, Answering her, Miserere. John Boyle O'Reilly Only second to the Chicago fire in destructiveness was that which visited Boston in the following year. It started on Saturday evening, November 9, 1872, and 65 acres were laid waste before it was controlled. Boston, November 9, 1872 O oh, broad-breasted queen among nations, O oh, mother, so strong in thy youth, Has the Lord looked upon thee in ire, And wilt thou be chastened by fire, Without any ruth? Has the merciful tired of his mercy, And turned from thy sinning in wrath, That the world with raised hand sees and pities, Thy desolate daughters, thy cities, Despoiled on their path? One year since thy youngest was stricken, Thy eldest lies stricken today. Ah, God, thy wrath without pity, To tear the strong heart from our city, And cast it away? O oh, Father, forgive us our doubting, The stain from our weak souls efface. Thou rebukest, we know, but to chasten, Thy hand has but fallen to hasten. Return to thy grace. Let us rise purified from our ashes, As sinners have risen who grieved. Let us show that twice-sent desolation On every true heart in the nation Has conquest achieved. John Boyle O'Reilly The district burned contained the finest business blocks in the city, and the loss was estimated at $80 million. For a time, it seemed that the famous Old South would be destroyed. The Church of the Revolution the Old South Stands Loud through the still November air The clang and clash of fire bells broke From street to street, from square to square 
rolled sheets of flame and clouds of smoke. The marble structures reeled and fell. The iron pillars bowed like lead. But one lone spire rang on its bell, above the flames. Men passed and said, The Old South stands. The gold moon, gainst a copper sky, hung like a portent in the air. The midnight came, the wind rose high, and men stood speechless in despair. But as the marble columns broke, and wider grew the chasm red, a seething gulf of flame and smoke, the firemen marked the spire and said, The Old South stands. Beyond the harbor, calm and fair, the sun came up through bars of gold, then faded in a wanish glare. As flame and smoke still upward rolled, the princely structures crowned with art, where commerce laid her treasures bare, the haunts of trade, the common mart, all vanished in the withering air. The Old South stands. The Old South must be leveled soon to check the flames and save the street. Bring fuse and powder, but at noon the ancient fane still stood complete. The mitred flame had lipped the spire, the smoke its blackness o'er its cast. Then, hero-like, men fought the fire, and from each lip the watchword passed, The Old South Stands. All night the Red Sea round it rolled, and o'er it fell the fiery rain. And, as each hour the old clock told, men said, Twill never strike again. But still the dial plate at morn was crimsoned in the rising light. Long may it redden with the dawn, and mark the shading hours of night. Long may it stand. Long may it stand, where help was sought, in weak and dark and doubtful days, where freedom's lessons first were taught, and prayers of faith were turned to praise, where burned the first Shekinah's flame, in God's new temples of the free, Long may it stand in freedom's name, like Israel's pillar by the sea. Long may it stand. Hezekiah Butterworth The nation rushed to Boston's aid, just as it had done to Chicago's, and the city soon rose from her ashes greater than ever. After the Fire While far along the eastern sky I saw the flags of havoc fly, as if his forces would assault the sovereign of the starry vault, and hurl him back the burning rain that seared the cities of the plain. I read as on a crimson page the words of Israel's sceptred sage. For riches make them wings, and they do as an eagle fly away. O vision of that sleepless night, what hue shall paint the mocking light? that burned and stained the orient skies, where peaceful morning loves to rise, as if the sun had lost its way and dawned to make a second day, above how red with fiery glow, how dark to those it woke below. On roof and wall, on dome and spire, flashed the false jewels of the fire, girt with her belt of glittering panes and crowned with starry gleaming veins, our northern queen in glory shone, with newborn splendors not her own, and stood, transfigured in our eyes, a victim decked for sacrifice. The cloud still hovers overhead, and still the midnight sky is red, as the lost wanderer strays alone to seek the place he called his own. His devious footprints sadly tell how changed the pathways known so well. The scene, how new, the tale, how old, ere yet the ashes have grown cold. Again I read the words that came, writ in the rubric of the flame. Howe'er we trust to mortal things, each hath its pair of folded wings. Though long their terrors rest unspread, their fatal plumes are never shed. At last, at last, they stretch in flight, and blot the day and blast the night. Hope, only hope of all that clings, around us never spreads her wings. Love, though he break his earthly chain, still whispers he will come again. But faith that soars to seek the sky shall teach our half-fledged souls to fly and find 
Beyond the smoke and flame, the cloudless azure whence they came. Oliver Wendell Holmes On May 16, 1874, the bursting of a reservoir dam at Williamsburg, Mass., caused a disastrous flood, costing 140 lives and the loss of $1,500,000 in property. The loss of life would have been far greater, but for the heroism of a milkman named Collins Graves, who rode forward in front of the flood, giving warning. The Ride of Collins Graves May 16, 1874 No song of a soldier riding down to the raging fight from Winchester Town. No song of a time that shook the earth with the nation's throw at a nation's birth, but the song of a brave man free from fear, as Sheridan's self or Paul Revere, who risked what they risked, free from strife, and its promise of glory pay his life. The peaceful valley has waked and stirred, and the answering echoes of life are heard. The dew still clings to the trees and grass, and the early toilers smiling pass. As they glance aside at the white-walled homes, or up the valley, where merrily comes, the brook that sparkles in diamond rills, as the sun comes over the Hampshire hills. What was it passed like an ominous breath, like a shiver of fear or a touch of death? What was it? The valley is peaceful still, and the leaves are afire on top of the hill. It was not a sound nor a thing of sense, but a pain like the pang of the short suspense that thrills the being of those who see at their feet the gulf of eternity. The air of the valley has felt the chill, the workers pause at the door of the mill, the housewife, keen to the shivering air, arrests her foot on the cottage stair, instinctive taught by the mother love, and thinks of the sleeping ones above. Why start the listeners? Why does the course of the mill stream widen? Is it a horse? Hark to the sound of the hooves, they say that gallop so widely Williamsburg way. God, what was that, like a human shriek? From the winding valley, will nobody speak? Will nobody answer those women who cry as the awful warnings thunder by? Whence came they? Listen, and now they hear the sound of the galloping horse hoofs near. They watch the trend of the veil and see the rider who thunders so menacingly. With waving arms and warning scream, to the home-filled banks of the valley stream. He draws no rein, but he shakes the street with a shout and the ring of the galloping feet. And this the cry he flings to the wind. To the hills for your lives, the flood is behind. He cries and is gone, but they know the worst. The breast of the Williamsburg Dam has burst. The basin that nourished their happy homes is changed to a demon. It comes, it comes. A monster in aspect, with shaggy front, Of shattered dwellings to take the brunt, Of the homes they shatter, white-maned and hoarse, The merciless terror fills the course. Of the narrow valley and rushing raves, With death on the first of its hissing waves, Till cottage and street and crowded mill Are crumbled and crushed. But onward still, in front of the roaring flood is heard, The galloping horse and the warning word, Thank God the brave man's life is spared. From Williamsburg town he nobly dared to race with the flood and take the road in front of the terrible swath it mowed. For miles it thundered and crashed behind, but he looked ahead with a steadfast mind. They must be warned, was all he said, as away on his terrible ride he sped. When heroes are called for, bring the crown. To this Yankee rider, send him down, on the stream of time with the courteous old, his deed as the Romans was brave and bold. And the tale can as noble a thrill awake, for he offered his life for the people's sake. John Boyle O'Reilly End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Lord. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various, Chapter 2. Chapter 2, The Year of a Hundred Years. The year 1876 marked the completion of the first century of independence, and it was decided to celebrate it in a worthy manner. The city of Philadelphia, where the country had been born, was fittingly selected as the place for the celebration. Our first century. It cannot be that men who are the seed of Washington should miss fame's true applause. Franklin did plan us. Marshall gave us laws. And slow the broad scroll grew a people's creed. Union and liberty, then at our need. Time's challenge coming. Lincoln gave it pause. Upheld the double pillars of the cause. And dying left them whole, our crowning deed. Such were the fathering race that made all fast, who founded us and spread from sea to sea, a thousand leagues the zone of liberty, and built for man this refuge from his past. Unkinged, unchurched, unsoldiered, shamed we were, failing the stature that such sires forecast. George Edward Woodbury The celebration took the form of a great industrial exposition at which the arts and industry of the whole world were present represented. The exposition was open on May 10, 1876, more than a hundred thousand people being present. Wigner had composed a march for the occasion, and Whittier's Centennial Hymn was sung by a chorus of a thousand voices. Centennial Hymn 1. Our Father's God, from out whose hand the centuries fall like grains of sand, we meet today united free and loyal to our land and thee to thank thee for the error done, and trust thee for the opening one. 2. Here, where of old by thy design, the Father spake the word of thine, whose echo is the glad refrain of rended bolt and falling chain. To grace our festal time from all, the zones of earth our guests we call. 3. Be with us while the new world greets, the old world thronging, all its streets, unveiling all the triumphs won by art or toil beneath the sun, and unto common good ordain this rivalship of hand and brain. 4. Thou who hast here in conquered furled the war flags of a gathered world, beneath our western skies fulfill the Orient's mission of good will, and freighted with love's golden fleece, send back its argonauts of peace. 5. For art and labor met in truce, for beauty made the bride of use, we thank thee, but with all we crave, the austere virtues, vir virtues strong to save, the honor proof to place or gold, the manhood never bought nor sold. 6. O make thou us through centuries long, in peace secure, in justice strong, around our gift of freedom draw, the safeguards of thy righteous law, and cast in some diviner mold, let the new cycle shame the old. John Greenleaf Whittier The restored South chanted the praises of the Union in the words of Sidney Lanier, the Georgia poet. The poem was written as a cantata, the music for which was composed by Dudley Buck. The Centennial Meditation of Columbia 1776 to 1876. From this hundred terraced height, sight more large with nobler light, ranges down yon towering years, humbler smiles and lordlier tears, shine and fall, shine and fall, while old voices rise and call, yonder where the to and fro, weltering of my long ago, moves about the moveless base, far below my resting place. Mayflower, Mayflower, slowly hither flying, trembling westward o'er yon balking sea, hearts within, farewell dear England sighing, winds without, but dear in vain replying, gray-lipped waves about thee shouted, crying, no, it will not be. 
Jamestown out of thee, Plymouth thee, thee Albany. Winter cries, ye freeze away, Fever cries, ye burn away, Hunger cries, ye starve away, Vengeance cries, your graves shall stay. Then old shapes and masks of things, Framed like faiths or clothed like kings, Ghosts of goods once fleshed and fair, Grown foul beds and alien air, War and his most noisy lords, Tongued with lithe and poisoned swords, Error, terror, rage, and crime, All in a windy night of time, Cried to me from land and sea, No, thou shalt not be. Hark, Huguenots whispering, Yeah, in the dark, Puritans answering, Yeah, in the dark, yeah, like an arrow shot true to his mark, darts through the tyrannous heart of denial, patience and labor and solemn soul trial, foiled, still beginning, soiled, but not sinning, toil through this stertorous death of night, toil when wild brother wars new dark the light, toil and forgive and kiss o'er and replight. Now praise to God's oft-granted grace, now praise to man's undaunted face. Despite the land, despite the sea, I was, I am, and I shall be. How long, good angel, oh, how long? Sing me from heaven a man's own song. Long as thine art shall love true love, Long as thy science truth shall know, Long as thine eagle harms no dove, Long as thy law by law shall grow, Long as thy God is God above, thy brother every man below. So long, dear land of all my love, thy name shall shine, thy fame shall grow. O music, from this height of time my word unfold, in thy large signals all men's hearts, man's heart behold. Mid heaven unroll thy chords as friendly flags unfurled, and wave the world's best lovers welcome to the world. Sidney Lanier. President Grant then declared the exposition open. It was a success from the very start, and great crowds were every day in attendance. Centennial Hymn, 1876. Through calm and storm the years have led our nation on from stage to stage, a century's pace until we tread the threshold of a we see where o'er our pathway swept a torrent stream of blood and fire, and thank the guardian power who kept our sacred league of states entire. O checkered train of years, farewell, with all thy strifes and hopes and fears, yet with us let thy memories dwell to warn and teach the coming years. And thou, the new beginning age, warned by the past and not in vain, write on a fairer, whiter page, the record of thy happier reign. William Cullen Bryant On July 4th, 1876, simple but impressive exercises were held in the public square in the rear of Independence Hall, where, a century before, a great throng had awaited the promulgation of the Declaration. Welcome to the Nations, Philadelphia, July 4th, 1876. Bright on the banners of lily and rose, Lo, the last sun of our century sets. Wreathe the black cannon that scowled our foes, All but her friendships the nation forgets, All but her friends and their welcome forgets. These are around her, but where are her foes? Lo, while the sun of her century sets, Peace with her garlands of lily and rose. Welcome, a shout like the war's trumpet swell, wakes the wild echoes that slumber around. Welcome, it quivers from liberty's bell. Welcome, the walls of her temples resound. Hark, the gray walls of her temple resound. Fade the far voices o'er hillside and dell. Welcome, still whisper the echoes around. Welcome, still trembles on liberty's bell. Thrones of the continent, isles of the sea, yours are the garlands of peace we entwine. Welcome, once more, to the land of the free, shadowed alike by the palm and the pine. Softly they murmur, the palm and the pine, 
Hushed is our strife in the land of the free, or your children their branches entwine, thrones of the continents, isles of the sea. Oliver Wendell Holmes The National Ode was read by its author, Baynard Taylor, whose deep voice and impressive delivery added appreciably to the majesty of the lines. The National Ode, Independence Square, Philadelphia, July 4th, 1876. One. Sun of the stately day, let Asia into the shadow drift. Let Europe bask in thy ripened ray, and o'er the severing ocean lift. A, broad, a brow of broader splendor, give light to the eager eyes of the light that waits to behold thee rise. The gladness of morning lend her, with the triumph of noon attend her, and the peace of the vesper skies, for lo, she cometh now, with hope on the lip and pride on the brow, stronger and dearer and fairer, to smile on the love we bear her, to live as we dreamed her and sought her, liberty's latest daughter. In the clefts of the rock, in the secret places, we found her traces. On the hills, in the crash of woods that fall, we hear her call. When the lines of battle broke, we saw her face in the fiery smoke. Through toil and anguish and desolation, we followed and found her with the grace of a virgin nation, as a sacred zone around her, who shall rejoice with a righteous voice, far headed through the ages, if not she, for the menace is dumb that defied her, the doubt is dead that denied her, and she stands acknowledged and strong and free. 2. Ah, hark, the solemn undertone, on every wind of human story blown, a large, divinely molded fate questions the right and purpose of a state, and in its plan sublime, our errors are the dust of time. The far off yesterday of power creeps back with stealthy feet, invades our lordship of the hour, and at our banquet takes the unbidden seat from all unchronicled and silent ages before the future first begot the past, till history dared at last, to write eternal words on granite pages from Egypt's tawny drift and Assur's mound, and where uplifted wide and far, Earth's highest yearns to meet a star, and man his manhood by the Ganges found, imperial heads of old millennial sway, and still by some pale splendor crowned, chill as a corpse, light in our full orb day, in ghostly grandeur rise, and say through stony lips and vacant eyes, Thou that assertest freedom, power, and fame, declare to us thy claim. 1, 2. On the shores of the co continent cast, she won the inviolate soil by loss of heirdom of all the past and faith in the royal right of toil. She planted homes on the savage sod, into the wilderness lone. She walked with fearless feet, in her hand the divining rod, till the veins of the mountain beat her, with fire of metal and force of stone. She set the speed of the river head, to turn the mills of her bread. She drove her plowshare deep, through the prairies thousand centuries sleep, to the south and west and north. She called Pathfinder forth, her faithful and sole companion, where the flushed Sierra snow starred, her way to the sunset barred, and the nameless rivers in thunder and foam channeled the terrible canyon, nor paused till her uttermost home was built in the smile of a softer sky, and the glory of beauty still to be, where the haunted waves of Asia die on the strand of the worldwide sea. I, I, too. The race in conquering, some fierce titanic joy of conquest knows, whether in veins of surf or king, our ancient blood beats restless in repose, challenge of nature subdued, unsubdued, awaits not man's defiant answer long, for hardship, even as wrong, provokes the level-eyed heroic mood, 
This for herself she did, but that which lies as over earth's the skies, blending all forms in one benignant glow, crowned conscience, tender care, justice that answers every bondman's prayer. Freedom, freedom where faith may lead and thought may dare, the power of minds that know, passion of hearts that feel, purchased by blood and wool, guarded by fire and steel, hath she secured what blazon on her shield, in the clear century's light shines the world revealed, declare a nobler triumph born of right. I three. Foreseen in the visions of sages, foretold when martyrs bled, she was born of the longing of ages, by the truth of the noble dead, and the faith of the living fed, no blood in her lightest veins, frets at remembered chains, no shame of bondage has bowed her head, in her form and features still, the unblenching Puritan will, cavalier honor, Huguenot grace, the Quaker truth and sweetness, and the strength of the danger-girdled race, of Holland, blend in a proud completeness, from the homes of all, where her being began, she took what she gave to man, justice that knew no station, belief as soul decreed, Free air for inspiration, free force for independent deed. She takes but to give again, and the sea returns the rivers in rain, and gathers the chosen of her seed from the hunted of every crown and creed. Her Germany dwells by a gentler Rhine, her Ireland sees the old sunburn shine, her France pursues some dream divine, her Norway keeps his mountain pine. Her Italy waits by the western brine, and broad-based under all is planted England's oaken-hearted mood, as rich in fortitude, as air went worldward from the island wall, fused in her candid light, to one strong race all races here unite, tongues melt in hers, hereditary foemen, forget their sword and slogan, kith and clan, t'was glory once to be a Roman, she makes a glory now to be a man. I, I, three. Bow down, doth thine Aenonian crown. One hour forget the glory and recall the debt. Make expiation of humbler mood for the pride of thine exaltation, or peril conquered and strife subdued. But half the right is rested when victory yields her prize, and half the marrow tested when old endurance dies. In the sight of them that love thee, bow to the greater above thee. He faileth not to smite the idle ownership of right, nor spares to sinews fresh from trial and virtued school in long denial. The tests that wait for thee in larger perils of prosperity, here at the century's awful shrine, bow to the Father's God and thine. I four. Behold, she bendeth now, humbling the chaplet of her hundred years. There is a solemn sweetness on her brow, and in her eyes are sacred tears. Can she forget, in present joy, the burden of her debt, when for a captive race she grandly staked and won the total promise of her power begun, and bared her bosom's grace to the sharp wound that inly tortures yet? Can she forget the million graves her young devotion set the hands that clasp above, from either side in sad returning love, can she forget, here where the ruler of today, the citizen of tomorrow, and equal thousands rejoice and pray, beside these holy walls are met, her birth cry mixed of keenest bliss and sorrow, here on July's immortal morn, held forth the people saw her head, and shouted to the world, the king is dead. But lo, the heir is born, when fire of youth and sober trust of age, in farmer, soldier, priest, and sage, arose and cast upon her baptismal garments, never robed so fair, clad prince in old world air, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. I, I, four. Arise, recrown thy head, radiant with blessings of the dead. Bear from this hallowed place the prayer that purifies thy lips, 
The light of courage that defies eclipse, The rose of man's new morning on thy face, Let no iconoclast Invade thy rising pantheon of the past, To make a blank where Adam stood, To touch the father's sheathed and sacred blade, Spoil crowns on Jefferson and Franklin lay, Or wash from freedom's feet the stains of Lincoln's blood. Hearken, as from the haunted hall, their voices call. We lived and died for thee, we greatly dared that thou mightest be. So from thy children still, we claim denials which at last fulfill, And freedom yielded to preserve thee free. Beside clear-hearted right, that smiles at power's uplifted rod, Plant duties that requite, and order that sustains upon thy sod and stand in stainless might, above all self, and only less than God. I, I, I won. Here may thy solemn challenge end, all proving past and each discordance die, of doubtful augury, or in one choral with the present blend, and that have heard sweet harmony, of something nobler than our sons may see, though poignant, poignant memories burn, of days that were and may again return, when thy fleet foot, O huntress of the woods, the slippery brinks of danger knew, and dim the eyesight grew, that was so sure in thine old solitudes, yet stays some richer sense, one from the mixture of thine elements, to guide the vagrant scheme, and winnow truth from each conflicting dream. Yet in thy blood shall live, some force unspent, some essence primitive, to seize the highest use of things, for fate to mold thee to her plan, denied thee food of kings, withheld the utter and orchard fruits, fed thee with savage roots, and forced thy harsher milk from barren breasts of man. I, I, I too. O sacred woman form of the first people's need and passion wrought, no thin pale ghost of thought, but fair as morning and his heart's blood warm, wearing thy priestly tire on Judah's hill, clear eyed beneath Athene's helm of gold, or from Rome's central seat, hearing the pulses of the continent be continents beat, and thunder where her legions rolled, compact of high heroic hearts and wills, whose being circles all, the selfless aim of men, and all fulfills. Thyself not free, so long as one is thrall. Goddess, that is, as a nation lives, and as a nation dies, that for her children as a man defies, and to her children as a mother gives, take our fresh fealty now, no more chieftainess with wampum zone, and feather cinctured brow, no more a new Britannia grown to spread an equal banner to the breeze, and lift thy trident o'er the trouble, double seas, but with unborrowed crest, in thine own native beauty dressed, the front of pure command, the unflinching eye, thine own. I, 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 three. Look up, look forth, and on. There's light in the dawning sky. The clouds are parting, the night is gone. Prepare for the work of the day. Fallow thy pastures lie and far thy shepherds stray, and the fields of thy vast domain are waiting for purer seed, of knowledge, desire, and deed, for keener sunshine and mellower rain. But keep thy garments pure, pluck them back with the old disdain, from, the touch, from touch of the hands that stain, so shall thy strength endure, transmute into good the gold of gain. Compel to beauty thy ruder powers, till the bounty of coming hours shall plant on thy fields apart with the oak of toil the rose of art be careful and keep us so be strong and fear no foe be just and the world shall know with the same love love us as we give and the day shall never come that finds us weak or dumb to join and smite and cry in the great task for thee to die and the greater task for thee to live Bayard Taylor Richard Henry Lee, grandson of the mover of the Declaration, came to the front with the original document in his hands and read its sonorous sentences. 
William M. Everts delivered an oration and our national banner, words by Dexter Smith, music by Sir Julius Benedict, was sung. Our national banner, July 4th, 1876. O'er the high and o'er the lowly floats that banner bright and holy in the rays of freedom's sun, in the nation's heart embedded, o'er our union newly wedded, one and all and all in one. Let that banner wave forever, may its lustrous stars fade never, till the stars shall pale on high, while there's right the wrong defeating, while there's hope in true hearts beating, truth and freedom shall not die. As it floated long before us, be it ever floating o'er us, o'er the land from shore to shore. There are freedmen yet to wave it, millions who would die to save it. Wave it, save it, evermore. Dexter Smith The exposition closed November 10, 1876. It had served to draw all sections of the country more closely together and to establish the industrial position of the United States among the nations of the world. After the centennial, a hope. Before our eyes a pageant rolled, whose banners every land unfurled, and as it passed its splendors told, the art and glory of the world. The nations of the earth have stood, with face to face and hand in hand, and sworn to common brotherhood, that sundered souls of every land. And while America is pledged to light her faro's towers for all, while her broad mantle starred and edged, with truth o'er high and low shall fall, and while the electric nerves still belt the state and continent in one, Discords of the past shall melt, like ice beneath the summer sun. O'er land of hope, thy future years are shrouded from our mortal sight. But thou canst turn the century's fears to heralds of a cloudless light. The sacred torch our fathers lit, no wild misrule can ever quench. Still in our midst, midst wise judges sit, whom party passion cannot blench. From soul to soul, from hand to hand. Thy sons have passed the torch along, whose flame by wisdom's breath is fanned, whose staff is held by runners strong. O spirit of immortal truth, thy power alone that circles all, can feed the fire as in its youth, can hold the runners lest they fall. Christopher Pierce Cranch End of chapter 2 Recording by Jason Lohr